And again, people study the effect of military service on many aspects of life, education, health, wages, and employment. I look at only wages or earnings, as I, as I call it. Now I'm very modest today. I'm, I'm saying it's evidence from a quasi-experiment, like almost experiment. This out of modesty, this, what I have here is really a natural experiment. I don't call it so, so I don't get criticism. That's, that's the whole idea, but you'll see why it's, it's, it's kind of experiment. Okay, so I said many years ago, many years ago someone, someone said the following, that when you go to the sea, you go with the agreement or the consent of your father. But when you go to be a soldier, it's always without the agreement of your father. And that's somebody, nothing other than Adam Smith himself in the Wealth of Nations. So when I saw this sentence, I started thinking about this effect of military service. Right? So what, what Adam Smith refers to here, there is a cost to be in the army. Right? That's why you don't go with the, with the agreement of your father. Again, it's, it's can be, today we speak about lost years, lost wages, that's cost. But other cost life, you can, you can lose your life there. So it's really costly. And that's why people try to estimate, you know, if that gives you a benefit afterwards. If you live after the army, do you get the, the benefits? Okay, so again, this is an important and old question. And Keynes himself, you know, John Maynard Keynes himself, said when he was forced to serve, he did not serve. And he said, I'm not willing you know, to surrender my right of decision in this particular uh, question. I'm not going to serve, but that's my freedom to choose and so on. But he was referring to the cost of doing it. And early on, I mean, I mean, 50 years ago, papers started coming up, theoretical papers, about the effect of military on your future earnings. But the idea here was more philosophical. What's hidden there? And this OA paper, AR old paper, the idea is there, there is implicit, it's like implicit tax. I am taxing you by forcing you to serve. I'm taxing you, but I don't call it tax. That's why he called it implicit tax. Afterwards, Angus 1990, he started studying the empirical effect, the actual you know, money value of this thing. And this Angus 1990, this he was a student. That's his dissertation when he was a PhD student at Princeton University. His dissertation became an AR most important paper in the field. Right? So again, students, you can do something which can be most important. Okay, so this guy, he did the empirical stuff. He tried to study whether really uh, military service affects your wage, up or down. Good. Now, I said, is it a simple question, you know, this effect of military service? I can compare myself before and after service, and that change in wage, that's the effect of military on, uh, on my wages. The problem here, as I said, is counterfactual. I cannot live in two worlds at the same time. So I either serve or not. At the same time, I cannot be serving and not serving. And I can't compare myself with myself. I cannot do that. The other thing I say, okay, so compare people who do serve with people who don't. And the problem here, as I say, it's selection. Those who do serve, they choose to serve. And this, those who don't, they choose not to. So maybe this choice is related to something else in their innate abilities or something, which might affect their weight as well. And the difference in wages is not due to military, but due to this hidden stuff which I don't control for. So it's not a it's not simple question. So a simple question, the answer is no. Theoretically, it's also ambiguous. We don't know the effect. While in the army, right, you lose wages and you lose labor market experience because you're not working in the market. So you lose, and so there's a loss. At the same time, you might gain some you know, good stuff in the army. You might learn some skills which are useful. So you gain something. So also theoretically, it's, it's ambiguous. We cannot predict whether you're going to benefit or you're going to be harmed uh, from service. And again, like, uh, in Israel I know, for example, you know, learning to drive. If you learn to drive in the army while you are a soldier, they pay for that. You know, they help you do that. So that's, that's again, which is useful to real life. And once you leave, if you are a driver, it right, helps, helps your wages. Right? So that's a skill which can be useful. So we don't know. Right? Again, Angus always claims that in the army you lose the labor market experience. That's useful for your wages. But here we say, look, there are other things that might be helpful. That many studies in psychology also that they tell you you learn many stuff, you know, many things, important stuff there. For example, again, uh, teamwork, uh, managing, uh, role models, all these things you can learn in the army. So they can be useful in the labor market. Discipline. Discipline. And that's psychological studies, not in economics, but still it's, it's something positive. Overall, you don't know what you get from this. Okay, so in general, uh, these are just examples of, of countries. Nowadays, countries are going towards all voluntary army. Not to force anybody. It's like a job. You pay for it. You, you, uh, you get paid. You serve, you get paid. So the countries are again US, UK, France, Italy, Spain, Portugal, and many others Eastern European countries. Again, they stop this mandatory service. You don't have to serve. It's like a job. 
we choose to serve. It's still, or these countries are not thinking about changing their rules where it's compulsory, say, like in Austria, Denmark, Switzerland, and Israel. Israel is my example because that's my data. That's where I, where I look today. A special case is Israel, and you'll see why, why it's a special case. We will look at the law and practice in Israel, how they, how they do it, why, why it's important. Yes. Uh, is it important to we will we will speak about that. But again, if it's lowest experience, then the longer you serve, the more it, it's costly for you, right? So if you can you can predict the cost of one year, and then it's the longer um, you know armies, it's uh, the more. If, if it's long term, you can have a very long, long, uh, long sentence to serve in the army, then you might you might not, you might not choose it. But if, if it's three months or something like that. No, no, in the voluntary case, I don't think there is a limitation. It's like a job, right? You can leave at any time, almost at any time. Maybe it's like short time. I, don't, I was not in the U.S. Army, so I don't know what they do there. But I think it's like a short-term uh, job, which you can extend, extend until you become general, commander, or whatever. You can do it doing wars and... Doing wars and That's the idea, right? Again, when you're doing wars, you cannot leave. So, yeah. Good, interesting. Okay, once again, if it's all, so countries are all voluntary or mandatory service. If it's all voluntary, then there's an issue of selection. So I cannot compare people who serve with those who don't because there's no select themselves into the army. Like in the US, it's a special example, right? Those who serve, why they serve, as you ask yourself. In countries where it's mandatory, there's no control group, so everybody serves. We want to convert the people. So it's a big, difficult question. And people thought what, what to do about it. So here I mentioned some empirical studies where they looked at it. I just care about their estimate. So I start with Angus 1990, that's the study that I mentioned to you. And this guy found a 15% effect, negative effect, on the weight of whites. He took the, you know, the Vietnam veterans, you know, the veterans from the Vietnam War. So it's in America, it's for whites and blacks, that's what, what he studied. He does not focus on blacks, but blacks have zero effect in that study. Insignificant effect. But for whites, they are harmed by, by service. That's, that's his main study, seminal work, everybody cites that. Yes. But uh, when when do you have this effect of minus fifteen percent? Like five years after leaving the army, or throughout your whole career afterwards? No, no, at, at some some point in time. I think he took look at nine, 1990 compared to the sixties when it, when it happened or whatever, uh -huh. thirty fives, or at some point in time. Because later on in this study, the third one, he studied the same people afterwards. So I'm not sure about the first one, how many years after service, but afterwards in the nineteen nineties. He and Chen study, and they found that negative effects are, are gone. So the third study says the same guys, the zero, so they are equal to the veterans, non-veterans are the same. And he claims, oh, again, it's my experience, uh, my explain his explanation, which is experience. That's with lifetime earnings, wage earnings. So That's the first paper. Okay, okay. Exactly, exactly. So the first study said, look, why you lose? Because you lose experience in that. While in the army, you lose labor market experience. You go to the market, you don't know how to work, you lose this, these wages. And then he said, okay, now because we found no effect after 10 or 15 years, it reinforces my explanation that it's experience. Now they gained it back, they regained the experience, so it's, it's okay, zero effect. Okay, other studies and other So, so angry is controls for all kinds of other things which might both influence my decision to go to the army. Uh, yeah, I, I, exactly, I should focus on that. The, the trick, uh, why it's smart paper, by the way, it's exactly uh, that comment, IV and draft. So, in Vietnam uh, uh, era, the Vietnam time, they were drawing people kind of randomly. Ah, I see. That's, that's what he used as instrumental variable, as we call it in econometrics. Yeah, it was a pure lottery system, so I mean, it was so, just it's exactly. as random as it gets, really. Uh, exactly. So, so there's social security number in the US, you know, like ID number here, and they just draw numbers. Later on in the other study, that number is related to your birth date, because, you know, you know, if you are born later on, then the number is bigger, because it's, just, well, just, it's, like, it's like a serial number. So it's a secret in the US, the serial number goes up with time. So he used this birth date as an instrumental variable for service. But, uh, I mean, this, uh, this lottery which was going on, was it really a fair lottery? So if I was a son of a senator or something, was my probability to be drafted to the army really the same as if I, I was a... I, I, uh, have, I have no clue. If you were the son of the senator, I think you will not be in the data to start. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody would come and ask. There were some ways to evade. Uh, there were some ways, and some some politicians later were blamed for yes, uh, draft dodging, for uh, dodging, yeah, dodging. Yeah. <laughs> and they, they, they earned a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, it's good to do that. <coughs> 
So Ingress, Ingress tries to assume his assumptions that his, it works. So I think he took care of, of these things. But in terms of variables, yes, he controlled for everything possible in the data. Anyway, the effect in, in Germany was studied by this war et al. and others. In Germany, again in Germany, they use, you have to use some trick. If there's no econometric trick, we are back in the problem of either selection or no counterfactual. That's, that's the problem. So the trick for these people that who was born in uh, the 30th of June in 1937 has to serve. Before that in Germany, you did not have to. Mm -hmm. So they use that discontinuity. Once again, it's like, like, like an IV, right? Because, because before, you don't have to, but you can serve. After that date, you have to serve. So they compare people who could have gone to people who have to go, right? So, and they find that the 17%, if you compare these people, that is 17%, a huge difference between wages. But this goes away once they take care positive. of it. Positive. That just if you compare grossly, these people, one who said one did not, 17% difference. Once you take care of that problem of selection, using this trick of uh, this quantity, they get zero effect. Wow. So in Germany, zero effect. In Britain, another study there, they found zero effect, and they claim, you know, these skills, same. What you learn from the army, skills, are equal to what you lose in terms of labor market skills, so this cancels. That's what they found in, in Britain. Again, a, a study that I like is in, in Portugal, Card and Cardoso, they, they study the same effect. And in Portugal, it was all, also, also, it was a um, uh, mandatory service. You have to serve. But the trick here, that they have a longitudinal data, <coughs> data over time. So they can take people who serve <coughs> and people who did not over time. And then those before serving in the army, the difference between them is like differences in abilities, which I don't observe. Take the same guys after the army, the same difference in abilities, plus the difference in military. This minus that, that's the net effect. That was their trick. And they found 4 to 5 percent positive effect. It's good to serve in the army, but only for unskilled people, like those who have elementary schooling or, or, or less. Those who are skilled, zero effect. There's no positive effect <coughs> on their wages. And this last study is like says finds 10 percent in the US. It's not like an influential study, but just very recent. Which I mean that people still study this effect. It's very important. Old question, but still relevant. OK. So that why, why, why it's important, or how we uh, uh, um, kind of attack this problem in, in Israel, I use the Israeli law and enforcement, you know, how they practice the law in Israel. And that's, that's kind of funny, but it provides, as I call it, controlled experiment. It's like a natural experiment in the lab. That was happening there. That's why I say it's experiment, it's not quasi-experiment. So the idea there that Israeli Arabs, again, uh, so I, uh, me and Derek are Israelis. He's Israeli Jewish, I'm Israeli Arab. So the experiment is happening here. He served in the army. I did not serve in the army. I don't have to, because the law, we'll see what the law says, okay? But I don't have to, in principle. That's why I'm not serve. Eric has to, he was there, so he has to serve. So we have two guys. And that's, that's kind of natural experiment. Right? Just put people in spite of them. It's not a choice variable, right? You put them in the army, so I can compare people in, in principle. Okay, we, 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 we'll, we'll talk about it. So who must serve? Jewish people and the Druze. In Israel, there are Jews and Arabs. They are all Israelis. I don't, speak about, I don't speak about Palestinians from the West Bank or the Gaza Strip. In Israel, with Israeli ID and Israeli citizenship, right? so you are called Israeli, there is 20% Arabs, almost 80%, 70-something Jewish people. Yes. Is it, is it I mean, uh, the location, is it based on nationality or religion? You mentioned Israeli Arabs, sorry, I don't know. Israeli Arabs, then. So, uh, but you also mentioned Muslims and Christians. Exactly, exactly. Let me is, is there explain that. So, Israeli Jews are Jews, Israeli Arabs are Christians, Muslims, and Druze. The thing is that you can, you, if you want to skip the military, you can choose your religion. Very interesting question. Oh, so, you mean that this, guy, out, I mean, these I mean, guys, the Druze, you are, you are alluding to these people who have to serve, right? Good. Very good question. So again, the Muslims, you heard about Islam, you know about Christianity for sure, you don't know the Druze. The Druze is a small sect 1,000 years ago in the Fatimid era in Egypt. So they, again, they sect themselves from Islam. They were Muslims and they said, oh, we are a different religion. They created their own religion in the year 1017, exactly 1,000 years ago. And since then, again, the caliphs, you know, the Muslims did not like them. They followed them and they fled to Syria, Lebanon, and the Galil, north of Israel, north of Palestine back then. And they are still living there. So these are a small group of people. That religion does not accept newcomers into it. There's no convert. You cannot convert to Druze. You can do it for Judaism, for Islam, but you cannot do it for Druze. So this group is closed for newcomers. There's new, no, new, no newcomers are allowed. I cannot choose to be Druze. I would like, I cannot. Right? That's, that's the whole idea there. So it's clean. 
right? You can't change between Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. So if I become Jewish, I don't know. <laughs> That's interesting. If I become Jewish, will they ask me to serve? I'm not sure about that. <laughs> I have to change my name first. That's the prerequisite. <laughs> and, and, anyway, my name is Follow Me. <laughs> so the, 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 the Arabs are, uh, again, Christians and Muslims, Arabs. I will call them from now on Arabs. And the Druze are also Arabs. They speak Arabic. They go to Arabic school. They are in the Arabic sector, everything is Arabic. And they, they, they say we are even more Arabs than the Arabs because they speak even better language than, than us. So they claim we are Arabs for, 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 for everything. But the country treats them differently. And the Druze males have to serve. You cannot become Druze, but if you are a Druze, you can become a Christian. Not even that. I think uh, you will be... You cannot exit either. The, I, I, the guys inside uh, will not really allow you. I, I know about cases where women, Druze women, you know, they fell in love with other uh, religious guys and from other religions, like Jewish, or, and they were killed physically. That's terminated. Okay. Right? So this happens. Uh, they will not allow you to leave that, that, that thing. So you are not allowed to look outside. Good, interesting. But the Druze religion, I'm not a specialist, not a scholar in that field, but I know it's tricky, and you are not allowed to see it if you are Druze until the age of 40. Before the age of 40, you, the secret book, it's a secret only, the Sheikh knows it. He will not uh, let you see it. Once you see it, you are not allowed to tell others. It's very secretive kind of religion. Even though they, they celebrate the holidays with us, with Muslims, like the, you know, after the Ramadan, the fasting, they, have, they celebrate the same days because originally it was Islam, but they claim we are, we are special. Now, Israel loved that specialty, and uh, service was imposed on them. Druze have to serve, even though they are Arabs. Arabs don't have to. I will see again the lotus soon. Sorry, but what were the, I mean, you'll get into this, but what were the, the reasons for these, these rules for conscription? Like, how, how did that come about where uh, Muslims and Christians were not required or not even able to serve? Yeah, let's see let's the law. Okay. Exactly. The answer to that is just, just the coming two slides. So, in Israel, the law, there is a law, again, the, the the defense service law, Hok Shirut Bitahon. Now this law says every citizen, I see every citizen or permanent resident has to serve. Once he turns or she turns 18, they, he or she has to serve in the army. That's the law, right? And that was 1949. So uh, since the inception of the state, it was there. Everybody has to. Okay. And uh, you asked me about the length of service. Again, generally it was all countries are going towards voluntary service. In Israel, it's the other way around. They start with one year for women. Now it's two years of service. They started with two years for males, now it's three years. So they increase. It's not only mandatory, it's longer with time. Again, because it's a funny place there. So, <laughs> these people have to serve by that law. But there are exceptions. And these exceptions can come by law, by arrangements, or by inaction, as I call it. So by law itself, in the law, which says everybody has to serve, if you are a woman who is pregnant, or a mother, or married, you are exempt, or you claim you are a religious woman, right? Then you are exempt from service. So that is in the law, which means if that happens, that's, they have to exempt you. And the, I call it something by arrangements, you know, and the law says, you know, the, the, the Minister of Defense has some freedom to exempt people. And this guy chose to exempt the ultra-Orthodox, the, the religious Jews, you know, the Jewish people who study only the Torah. We call it in Hebrew, Torah to omnuto. These people study the Torah and the yeshiva all the day. They do nothing, just study the Torah. If you are like that, you are exempt by this minister who said, go away, you are exempt, you don't have to serve. Now, later on, again, the Supreme Court is not like that and said, okay, it cannot be like this. It's against the law. You have to instate a new law which allows these people to be exempt from service. And then, really, the Knesset, uh, you know, instated a new, a new law. It's called Tal's Law, after the honorable judge, uh, Tzvi Tal. That's the guy who was the head of the committee. So they called the law after him which says ultra-Orthodox should be exempt. And this has expired a date of five years. So every five years, they extend the law. They extend twice. In 2012, the Supreme Court said this law is unconstitutional. It should expire in August, the 31st of August 2012. It did expire. But then there was election and, you know, all the deals of elections, you know, with politics. So I don't know what's happening today. They don't have to serve. They go. If they don't go, nobody will follow them and all this. But that's because of dirty politics. But that's, that's like, until then it was clean. They don't serve by this arrangement. Last group, Israeli Arabs. I call it by inaction. And what's, what's inaction? The law say for everybody to serve, an enumerator, some guy, who sends requests you have to, you know, to attend the, the back home. And this date, which means you have to be, you are, today you are recruited. This guy sends mail to people. 
come, you are, you are enlisted already. This guy chose not to send these mails to Arabs. So by inaction, he did not say you are exempt. He just did not send them physical mail. I have not received a mail at home which says, come, you are, you are recruited to the army. And since then it was happened by just a second, by inaction, so passively and retroactively, we are practically exempt from service. Since then nobody served. There are two volunteers that are here and there, but nobody serves. You don't receive a request, I will not come here. So how government distinguish Arabs and Druze? So by names they're almost the same. Good, good, good. interesting question. You know, so again, uh, uh, it used to be in the ID card, the religion. Now it is, it is in the religion. And it was ruled unconstitutional in, I think, 2002 or something, <coughs> and now it's, it's dropped. Even Lyon, nationality is not allowed to write. Nationality was never allowed, but religion... No, no, it was allowed. I, ha I have two ID cards, before and after. With nationality? My, yeah, my blue ID card. It was Arabi, Arab. Now it's nothing written there. But my name is Muhammad, so I cannot be Jewish, right? <laughs> so it's, it's funny. No, but, yes. But, uh, what you're an artist, just writing in your ID card is your no, 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 that, uh, they don't write religion, but when they write the Leom, the nationality, I, 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 I'm skipping something, but anyway, let me come to the truth, these people. In 1957, 1955, the country said to the Druze, look, you are a special group, you are not Arabs like the others. I will call you Druze from now on, not Arabs. And since then, 1956, it started in their ID cards, written Druze. We, Muslims or Christians, Arabs written, and for them Druze. So that's how you distinguish, not by name, by ID cards. By the way, if you want to distinguish between Palestinian and Israeli Arab, it's a blue ID card and red. It used to be red, today it's green, because the Palestinian Authority. So they buy colors. And I see your ID card, I know you are Arab or Palestinian or Jews, just from the outside. Funny. Anyway, but that's nice for experiments, and that's, you know, that's all the time I did with this. Yes. Question. Uh, I've heard, and some people say that, so I mean, so that 60% almost Israeli population is atheist. How is it? Is it? No, but atheists, but they have to serve. They are Jewish people, right? They don't care if you pray or don't pray. Your name is Moshe, you come to army. That's it. <laughs> right? So, uh, again, once uh, Eric has two stories related to this, this talk. Well, first, about the atheist, about the central bank. He can tell you that later. The second, I will need it in the end. Right? So he claimed, I am atheist. Look at the atheist, but you are Jewish, so you serve in the army. <laughs> It's like 6 I'm not sure about that. I have no clue. Actually, Israel is a very religious state in principle. Right? Uh, not all the Orthodox, not everybody, but you go to Jerusalem, you don't feel 60% are atheists. But Jerusalem may be a special, special case. I don't know. Sorry. Can you choose nationality? When they ask you if you are Arab or. Yeah, you, when you fill out the form to get the ID card, you, you, you fill that. <laughs> I think that's how I got the idea of multiple choice in my exam. Right? <laughs> There's no multiple choice, right? They ask you what's the nationality of your father, so you cannot be. Oh, okay. But again, you can become a Jewish, and this happens, but very rarely, right? You know, people who convert from Christianity or, or Islam to Judaism. It's happening. Good. This is very interesting. Much more interesting than I thought. Okay. But again, because it's really all these. Uh, in, you know, it's, it's idiosyncratic things there that happen. Uh, anyway, they were not called to service. Just not called to service. They did not serve all these years. And <coughs> relatively, you know, there is a human resources uh, uh, unit in the army, the head, and they have, they have internal commands in the army. They have numbers for these. And this command, one, one, say, as a rule, Arab Muslims and Christians shall not be enlisted. They shall not be called to service. So they give, you know, Bushbank, as we say in Hebrew, right? They, they confirmed what this guy what the enumerator was doing. He was not sending the request, now he does not have to send the request. Anyway, bottom line, we don't serve. We don't serve in the, in the army. The other Israeli Arabs, other Druze, the one that I was alluding to all the time, these guys are about 2% uh, of the country, 1.7% of the country. Arabs are 20%, of which, of which 8 to 10% are Druze. So these Druze, again, the, the, the group does not grow much because it does not accept newcomers into it. It's only Net, uh, natural growth. And these truths are saying, well, yeah, you're Arabs, but let, let, let us treat you differently. We give you status of a new religion. So the Druze loved it in the 1956. And they signed that agreement. And again, the country uh, claims uh, that it's due to their request. So the Druze were all the time asking, please enforce us to serve in the army. That's what the Israel says, the, the, the official um, statement of the country. 
that the Druze asked for it, and they want to be enlisted, and they want the law to be enforced on them. There's a law anyway, the law is there. I mean, they can call me today that to serve, because there's a law. It's just, we, it's not applied to us. But this, the country claims, they ask for it to be employed on them, and then the country enforced. But nowadays, again, the studies, and through my readings, I saw that many Druze are against it, actually. It was enforced on them. It was not by their request. Some guys with self-interest, they were they requested, like some Knesset members, Druze Knesset members, they benefit from that. And the Sheikh Amin Tarif, one of the Sheikhs of the, of the, of the Druze, he was given a status of spiritual authority by the state, right? And then he signed that paper on behalf of all Druze, that every guy who turns 18 Druze, he has male, right? Females don't have to. So that's the only difference between Jews and, and Druze. So that's, that's the idea, that's how it started. So I, again, so it's the idea of the state to kind of alienate the Druze from their brother, brother Arabs or fellow Arabs. That was the original, that's the, what the Druze nowadays claim the, 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 in the Druze community. And they have actually lots of committees speaking about this all the time. So, so it was enforced, not selection. They select themselves into it. They just, yes. I mean, given that this was a minority which was persecuted by the Muslims for thousands of years, probably or one thousand years, I don't find it too surprising that they are siding with Israel here. So. But that's another claim, by the way, that they signed for that for protection and for living, because in, until 1956 they were serving before that. For sure, they served with the Haganah before Israel, before the state. They were serving, but. With, uh, but they were receiving money for it, so it was a job. So they claim it's for protection, for the Jews to protect us against the Arabs, which was not, they were not persecuted in Israel, never happened, right? But they claim so, and for money, we can receive money, why not to do it? In 1956, when it became a law, they stopped being paid, they are like the Jews, they have to. But uh, yes, live, li livelihood and protection was, was, was a claim, which is not believable nowadays, given all these, these studies. Anyway, Druze have served, we don't have to serve, let's compare us. And that's, that's the whole idea. So what we are doing, I just want to see the average, this E is like expectation, right? So just average, difference between wage one, wage zero. This is individual I, so I am I. What's my potential weight if I serve, W1? And what's my potential if I don't? The difference, that's the, the benefit for me. It's conditional on, on characteristics of me, right? On my age, my, my other, other stuff, right? So that's what I want. However, we cannot observe this. I cannot see Muhammad at the same time in two situations. So what we observe is the average wage of those who serve. S1, serve. S0, don't serve. And the average, so I have two groups of people, those who serve, those who don't. I see the difference between them, that's not a big deal. But if you do the trick of adding, subtracting this guy, again, this first is this first, and the last is the last. I'm adding and subtracting the same animal, PW0 here, right? So this is this is equal, I just add a minus a, plus a minus a. But once you do it this way, you can write it nicely. In the second part, it's called selection bias. That's the average wage, potential wage, of non-service for those who serve. Even those who serve, they could have not served, and they have a wage. So there's a potential, they're always theoretical number, right? This would be zero, but no, those who serve and those who don't serve, they are different people. But by their choice, they choose not to serve. And that's why this number is not zero, the whole thing. It's not zero, we call it a bias. It does not, so it confounds, it puts some dirt on my estimate. I get what I want, plus something which I have nothing to do about. The idea in Israel, because it's, I force you to serve or not to serve, it's not a choice. S is not my choice. I don't choose to be in the zero group or the one group. If I do, I go to serve, or my Arab, I don't serve. And that's why this part disappears, as I say here, this part all disappears. Because S1 and S0 are random, just like blindly I draw people into and out of uh, army, so this is zero, and I end up this equal to exactly what I wanted. This one I wanted up. See, so what we observe is indeed the cause and effect, and that's pure natural experiment. I don't need instrumental variables or do these these tricks to to estimate that. See, this guy becomes zero. So this, the observable gap is exactly the gap that you want. Controlling for variables, for sure you have to control for again age, experience, schooling, all these things affect your wages. Good. So because of that, I can just compare these people. Bottom line, I, I estimate a difference and difference is uh, regression. And the idea, I still want to control for things before the army. So if I am a Druze and you are non-Druze, before the army we are a little bit different. So I want to clean up that difference. I, it's true that I can compare today, but cleaner to clean the background differences. Right? So if you are abler than me, let's say, in the past, this ability gap will stay there. So let me clean it up. How we do that? by differencing before and differencing after, for both groups. 
You can do it manually, or you can do it by regression. So if you're not in such a regression, or you put Jews, one if you are Jews, zero otherwise. I, I think only Arabs. My sample is only Arabs. Jews and non-Jews, okay? There's no, no Jewish people, in this, in, at least in this regression. Serb is a value that I define, takes the value one after army age. So in Israel, you go at the age of 18, 21 you finish, right? So in my case, 25 or above, Serb gets one. Before, it gets zero. Right, so I will skip some, some, um, uh, sorry, uh, I'm confused. Like, why is it a Drew, Dami, and Serb Dami are different? Because uh, uh, you said not, before so that if you're Jews, you serve. You serve, you're right, not, right. So serve is confusing, the name serve is confusing. I, it's an age variable, gets okay. one if you are above 25, zero otherwise. Okay. Okay, so it is potential serve for Arabs. <coughs> it is for sure serve for, for Jews. This is the same variable. If, I, if my age is 25, I have served if I'm Jews, I did not serve if I'm Arab. So this is potential service. That's why the, the name is confusing. You're, you're right. And then the interaction term, that's the guy I'm looking for. The coefficient here is the, is the effect, pure effect of military on your wages. Okay? So again, that's, that's, that's the idea. So we have the, these Arabs before service, after service. And the Jews. When, once you skip that service time, things happen to you. You just grow up, you have more experience, da da da. The difference here for the Druze, the Druze people between these and before, it's military plus other things that they got. For Arabs, it's only the other things that they got. They have no military. So this minus that is the difference in differences. Right? That's the difference in difference in estimator. Some of you have seen it. First year students will see, will see it too. Okay? So, so the idea here also that's important, why I have this nice graph, I don't care who's here. Right? Control uh, for all x's. I take all this group, all these groups, and all do the differences. Later on, you will see what I do with that also. Okay, now my data, I use the census of Israel. That's, again, the most comprehensive data set in the country. It, takes, it has 20% of the country are in the census. So it's huge. But because it's huge and because Israel is a small state, they were afraid that people can, again, out of privacy issues, they can locate other people through the, the data. If I have 20% of the country, so almost everybody is there, and I see somebody who is a doctor who gets 10,000 uh, shekels a month. He lives in the south, like in whatever, uh, in Arogot or whatever, some place. I will know the guy by name. And that's, you know, against uh, privacy. So the Central Bureau of Statistics made our life, econometricians, difficult by omitting variables or putting interval variables. Right? Again, it's a huge data set, 1 million, 1 million 100,000 observations. I don't use all of them because I, I will take Jews out to add Arabs. But anyway, that's the original, original sample. Here I say, most important, the dependent variables are grouped. They don't want to put 10,000 shakers. They put your weights between 5 and 50, right? You're schooling between 2 and 3. All these internal variables, what we do with it? Again, it, it complicates stuff. We know how to run a regression, but my internal variable, I, I, we, just, we just get stuff, right? So how you, if you need some variable, let's say wage. And it says, I, I think the next slide, that's example. If my weight between zero and thousand, I will get the variable will say one. I will not see this. I will see the one in the data. If my weight in this interval, I will see two, and so on. So what I do with it? One way I say, oh, look, I will take the midpoint. So zero to one thousand. So maybe let's take five hundred. Very intuitive solution, and wrong. But anyway, <laughs> one thousand to nine thousand, right? For example, whatever. Nine thousand. That's what eight thousand. So five thousand is exactly in the middle, midpoint. That's one way to, do, to go about it. It gives you something, but then with some bias. Okay, or you assume uniform distribution over that interval. Assume everybody, I can take any value between zero and thousand. That's uniform distribution with equal probability. And then I can use that. I produce the numbers and use them, which is okay also. Or, or you can use advanced econometric technique. Some trick to overcome that. That's especially if your dependent variable is interval. If the independence is not, it's okay. Just use dummy variable and you are done. It's the dependence. It's interval. That's the problem. Yes. Why can't I just use these numbers, one, two, three, four, <laughs> these brackets as my dependent no, variable? No, because they're not uh, comparable. Right? If I have four, I'm not four times richer than one. But then it's just a matter of interpretation. I have to understand that these are not linear brackets. But then you cannot run the regression, because we run a linear regression by definition. So yes, you can use the midpoint, which is, which is similar to what you are saying. I put 500 here, 5,000 here, whatever, 15,000 here, and I can use that number. I said it will produce bias. It is possible. But these numbers are meaningless. 1, 2, 3, 4 are meaningless. I could use 1 minus 17, 24.4. Anything would distinguish me from the other groups. Also, category 4 would be problematic. You don't know. It's open ended. Open ended. Exactly. Yeah. 
<laughs> sometimes they truncate. If your weight is about 20,000, they will put something uh, for the number four. In my case, I think it's, I have 17 categories or something, not four, but this is for the example. Okay, but anyway, the economic technique is exactly this what we call interval regression. You haven't heard of it. Again, it was introduced by Stewart in 1983. Almost very, very few studies use that, right? So it's, uh, it was unknown, even to me when I started dipping into it. Interval regression, he used it when he looks at the dependent variable. And it's interval, there's a trick to go about it. You have to assume some normality and all these issues, and then use maximum likelihood estimator. Back then, computers were so slow, so he used a two step or less estimator to approximate the maximum. It's a long story, but it's a maximum likelihood estimate. Today, software can use maximum likelihood or these two steps or less, and that produces nice, nice, nice results. You can use the variable as is when it's interval variable. The y is interval. It's called interval regression. Okay, nowadays software can tackle that. Before that, it was not possible. So even people like me who don't know anything about econometrics can use this. Today. Good. So the summary statistics in our case, I just did say look, monthly earnings that I care about. All these variables are the controls. And see, here, when I say Jews, Druze, or non Druze Arabs, they are in this age group. When I say, oh, it's everybody 44, 30, 30, 44 or below. Because my highest age, I think, is 44. And see, that's what I care about. Look, that's the wage of Israeli Arabs, monthly. And that's the monthly wage. Again, it's in shekels. Every, every, uh, nowadays, it's she one dollar is four shekels. Four shekels, yeah. Back then, in this data, it used to be three shekels. So you divide by three, you get thousands. So that's the wage of Arabs. That's the wage of Jews. The difference is 800 shekels a month, and that's statistically significant. This three stars is 0 0.0001 significance, unlike Unclear the number of observations you have in the table. Because uh, you say you only use the Jews and the non-Jews Arabs, right? So this is going to be 10,000. But you have 98,000 in the first line. No, again, I said the first one is everybody 44 or below. So what, what is the point of showing that? Just for the sake of. Just for the comparison, to see the you know, benchmark, kind of. Okay. Sure. All the others are in this age group, all the other columns. Now I focus on this age group and the next one on the this is after like this is fifteen years after five to fifteen years after the army. Muhammad, what about gender? Males. These are all only males. males. Sorry, that's important. <coughs> only males. Because Druze males have to serve. Druze females don't have anyway. And Druze, and Arab females don't have. So I cannot convert these people. I will convert them later. I don't know if there's later. Okay. Anyway, so the difference is statistically significant. The difference in other variables is not statistically significant, which means the groups are comparable. Because when I talk to people, they tell me, look, how you know if the Druze are comparable to Arabs? Maybe they are different animal. That's why they receive different wage. So how I know? I just compare the characteristics, right? Again, education, all these schooling issues and experience. And they are not statistically The difference between these guys is not really, it's not different from zero. Education is borderline. It's, it's a borderline, right? Uh, education, you see an impact, actually, because because you, <coughs> you have more schooling years than I do. Because I spent... Just because the army? Because just I, because I spent five years doing things that you didn't have to. Yeah. Good. But you can have compensated for that, and you did not. That's a different question. Well, because... because. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so here, uh, I don't know if it's marginal in terms of... Statistical significance, yeah. it's it's this actually is one here, so it's not it's far from two. Oh I thought that it, oh, it's a standard error in the parentheses. Right. And then it's not statistic, statistic, it's standard error. Okay. So it's really zero. The previous one is not zero, the, the younger guys, but still, you know for weekly working hours for schooling it is zero. Good. So and by the way, that's important. These look at the Jewish people, they do serve. And Druze do, do serve, still there's a huge gap between them. <coughs> <clears throat> and that's my paper about discrimination, so there's a gap there. That's why I don't compare, I could compare the Jewish guy with the Arab guy. This served, this is not served. And I claim the gap is for military, but it's not true because look, this serves and this serves. Still there's a huge gap between them, but that's what we call, might be discrimination or other issues. And that's other study which we, which we have. Okay, so again this just shows that the, the wage of... of, of that, that's a problem for your paper, right? Because uh, then uh, you, you estimate the average treatment in the sense of the treated, uh, but only for the Druze. So, uh, the implication is going to be limited to Druze, which is a minor group. You want to really know what is the earning, uh, earnings uh, gain for the Jews. I, I, I acknowledge, acknowledge this. This is that. true. This is true. It's three. I, I do the eight, not eight, 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 right? Not for the treated. 
in the population, but it has assumptions based on this group. There's average treatment for the treated, and there's average treatment in general. That's what I estimate, the in general, but still. But before you show the average treatment of the treated. No, the, this one is just the gross gap, you know, once I, you do the, you will see it. Uh, okay, sure. Good. This just so again, the wage of Druze, stochastically first order dominates that of Arabs, which means that each income level, the probability of a Druze getting this income or higher, is higher than that of an Arab guy. So their wage for the both age groups, right? So it means Druze gets get more money. But again, this will show us a peak on the upcoming results, that at the age, that's when you finish service. It jumps, that's for females, that's for males. Non Druze, Druze. So females jump a little bit, but males jump a lot. And I claim this jump is due to army. That's for male, Druze, after and before. See the jump at the discontinuity. That's 21 years old, that's when you finish the army. I don't, I, to clean up the results, I take it forward to make sure I'm clean. But this is just, the graph shows something at least. Again, I'm reminding us what I'm, what I'm gonna estimate. But I remind myself, this serve should take one once you finish the army. So where, where I define it, and uh, it also depends on my data. 18 to 21, you serve. Before you are control group, after you are treatment group, because you are already served. But in the actual data, I don't have these categories. I have categorical variable. So I have A, 0 to, uh, not 0, 15 in our case. From 15 to 19, then 20, 24, and then after. So after is clean. What I do with this group in the data, once I treat it like control group, as if you did not serve, because part of this really does not say, you see, this coincides with people don't serve. And those who are after just right after military, still not absorbed in the market, still you can treat them like control. Or cleaner, exclude them from the analysis. But I do both exercises, okay? I first exclude all these groups. I compare only the after, purely after, with purely before. And then I control it, so just for that experiment, and these are the, 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 the results, main results. I say including it was not clean, because you know some people do serve, some people are finished, so it's not clean, I would really tend to believe these results more than the others. Mm -hmm. And the coefficient of serve multiplied by Jews, that's my difference in difference estimator. Right? All the other are not important here. They have interpretation, but we don't care about it. We care about that coefficient. And that's what I'm finding here. 19%. If I focus on the unskilled people only, it's 18%. Statistically significant and economically very, very significant. Much more than all other studies that you saw before. If you serve in the army, you get a raise of 18% in your wages. That's huge. Right? That's equal to three or four years of schooling. That's, that's, that's a lot. So I do this exercise for all my subgroups. Again, the difference in different estimator for men, because only men serve and don't serve, right? And this age group. Next, I see the 15 years to 25 after army. Is that effect just now, today, once I finish, or it continues, right? It, it is long-lived or short-lived? Actually, it goes up with time. Once you are age 35, like a mid-career guy, to 44, the, the, the premium becomes 23%. It's 5% more than right after. So it not only increases your wage, it also gives you like steeper uh, wage age profile. Your, your, your wage uh, increases faster than others with time, if you serve in the army. So it's like a huge premium, but again I have to defend it much because people will be against it. That's too huge, but I was not really surprised in Israel, right? Again, and then we'll talk about that more. Now, this is methodology. It's enough, it proves the point. But then I say, look, let's deal with other, other issues. Let's take people only after service. So not have to worry, my, what's my control group? I will compare Arabs who served with Druze, who served with Arabs who did not serve, right? After the service age. I'll take only the guys who are potentially served. But to compare that, I have to match them correctly, and that's what we call the probability score matching. There's lots of ways of matching guys together. But you want the similar guys, comparable guys. Right? Again, lots of matching methods. I use here simple probability score matching, which means I, I, I don't care about this group before. I look at only the after, the Druze and the Arabs. Now this guy is sad. I will match him with the sad guy here. See? Two sad guys. The happy guys, I'll match them with the happy people. And this happy and sad, and the faces, are explained by my variables. You know, so people with similar schooling, you know, similar marital status, if they married once, twice, or never married, all these things, you know, they are divorced, separated, widowed. I match based on this, this stuff. Not only in this graph. I would have loved to have such a graph in the data. I don't have, but that's the idea. Match similar people from the truth to their, you know, counterfactual, to their, to their uh, counter guy in the other group. And once you match them, 
see, uh, this guy is Druze, this is non Druze, he's similar. What's the difference in their wages? And do the average over everybody. That's what you get average treatment effect. Right? So this gives you a performance score. There are lots of ways of doing it. I do it with matching you know, with one neighbor or two guys or three guys, just for robustness. And generally, these are different from the difference in differences. So one, one, one of them has to be wrong. And that's why people in the studies, they don't combine both. I haven't seen studies, much studies at least, or zero studies, I saw zero studies, where they put both of them in the same paper. Because they will not get the same thing. I was lucky to get the same thing, which gives robustness to the previous results. Now, see, this promise is for matching. Same group people. Look, it's 17% the effect of military service. Comparing only after, so I don't have to worry about the control group. It's only after service. Age, me with a cruise guy. 17%, and then I can do average treatment. This age is average treatment. Effect. The average effect on everybody. Then you can do the, the two matches, which means I don't match me with one cruise, only with two cruise, and make the average. So when you match with more people, the variance goes down, right? So it's, it's more accurate. But the bias might go, to, go up because you might compare me with somebody who's not really similar to me. The similar and the next similar. The next similar. The further you go, the more bias you get. But the bias goes down, I'll see, the bias goes down. So you are more precise. Now, there's the numbers are not really changing. So I'm happy that fit is 17, 18%. As I said before, that's for the young guy. And for the older people, it's 26. Again, 24%. This is, this, this is stable. 26, and the unskilled is 19%. I still would claim the same effect. All previous studies, town. The unskilled to benefit more. If you are unskilled, you benefit more from the army because you have no other choice. So in the army, you learn something. That's not in our data. It's, it does not matter if you are schooled or not. Both get almost same, same thing. In the end, I do what we I call a falsification test. You know, to check your results, you do a falsification test. Check the same thing for people who don't serve. And here I take the women. I told you, women, if they are Jews or not Jews, they don't serve. So I will run the same regression for women. Right? If you find an effect there, then your causal effect was not really causal, it was something else. Right? So I will hope for a zero effect here. Remember, once again, I will compare a non-serving woman with a non-serving woman. <laughs> should be, nothing, should be, not, nothing should be different. And that's what I show here, both for the difference in difference and for the process score. The effect is 0 0.038, statistically zero. All the effects are statistically zero. So for women, there is no effect in the, which means the effect that I found before it's due to military service. Because if it was due to something else, you know, I would find some effects here as well. So this is a falsification test. You should find zero. You do find zero. That's very supportive of the results. Again, the process score also supports the difference in the process. Yeah, yes. but, I don't know, I mean, I'm using women, I don't know whether it's a, of course it's a nice idea, but I'm not completely convinced because, of course, as you know, level four participation by women is sort of very different from that for men and for men. So, I mean, you're really comparing something very different. But why different between Arabs and Jews? That's no. Uh, what I'm saying is that you should control for level four participation. But, I mean, th this type of regression is not robust as the one you showed before. So I, I, I could I could just claim that these estimates are, 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 are biased. So you you, you 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 use as a placebo a biased estimate to basically see whether you can falsificate facil a consistent estimate. That's my point. So. So the participation, so if you see, say, well, because selection to level market for the labor market participation yeah, between, okay. ma between women, Arabs. Women, and women get married, uh, get pregnant, uh, work and not work. But, <laughs> no, again, uh, married and pregnant is okay because it's all, all controlled for, but you are right about the participation rate. So if I show that Arabs and Druze have same participation rate, women, then I'm safe, right? Okay. That's, that's, so I, I should say that in the stati summary statistics, and I show this, should show it clearly that the participation rate for women, whether you are Druze or not, same before and after. Then it's not an issue of participation. So Druze women don't participate and they do afterwards. So it's 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 it's, it's important issue. But I think if I show just some statistics of that should be safe. If it's very different, I'm not safe. Right? It's, but I, it's important to show it. I cannot control for it in the revision because it's an aggregate measure, but I can show the summary of that for sure. Again, here I just look at the other group, the older women. <coughs> Comparable to the men, same zero effects, statistically zero effects. Don't worry about this guy. This guy effect is for surpassing, this, you know, succeeding that age. Once you you know pass that age, you grow up. But this is true for everybody. That's the difference and the difference. The change for me as Bruce compared to uh, a non Bruce Arab. Zero. So it it, it works. Hopefully the participation rate is, is the same. 
Again, there are other robustness checks, which I don't do in the study. I do in the analysis, but I don't show in the study because they, are, uh, they have some issues. The law, as we saw, said before, if you are early married, before the army, you are a woman, you are exempt. If you are a Jewish woman, so I, now forget about the Arabs. A Jewish woman, if she is married before the army or pregnant with that, but, but married, then she does not serve. If she is not married, she has to serve. So I can compare those who marry before the army with those who don't marry before the army. So I do the same analysis and I find positive effects, which supports my effect. There is effect, it's positive, it's significant. The problem with it, to marry or not, it's a choice variable. So there's selection issues and they have to solve these, that complicates stuff. Is and the I, effect weaker? What? Is the effect weaker among the, in, when you do it with men? For women, it's, it's good. For ultra orthodox, it's weaker. So I, I will speak about ultra orthodox. But it, it's not that weaker. Still in 10 or more. 10 or it, more. It, it is, is, is yeah, smaller than about the before, but it may be 10% or something around that. But it was statistically significant. And again, I dropped it because I'm sure I will hear a criticism about selection. You choose to marry. Nobody forces you to do that. And if you choose to marry to avoid military, maybe your ability is lower, so that's why your weight is lower and all these issues. And uh, I, you, we can't think of economic solutions of that, but that's in a different paper, right? Not now. The other thing is ultra-Orthodox Jews, we say they are also exempt, so I can do the exercise. For Jewish males now, if you are a Jewish male, but you are religious, you don't serve. If you are not religious, you do serve. Or any non-religious, you do serve. I'll compare two guys, once again, selection. I can avoid military by going into my religion, so it's a selection issue, and I have to solve that. But finding a positive effect there, much lower, by the way, for ultra-Orthodox, like 9%, still was good, was supported. And why it's lower? There are lots of studies which show that the benefits of the minority, like the Druze and the Arabs, are always bigger than the, uh, the benefits of the majority, from the same service. Because they start from lower point, right? If they're in the same way, after war, they jump more than the Jews who are already here. So it's very intuitive. It explains that. You're done? No, no almost. <laughs> I mean, I have uh, something to say. Go ahead. Uh, but it takes no knowledge of the context, and the, the, maybe what drives the results is the fact that the Jews, because of, by virtue of, of serving in the army, have access to military jobs. That's an interesting question, an interesting and they uh, do. comment. And they do. They, they basically, lots of them, I will refer to that as a well. whole bunch of them, serve as officers and as professional military. No, those who are in the military, physically military job, they are not in the data. Right? Soldiers are not uh, But if they're professional soldiers? But if they are something related to military, which means like, again, you go to some intelligence uh, company, and you are there because you are in the military, so you are a civilian guy. But what, what been, you are saying that soldiers are not who are 42 years old, and they are now a colonel in the Israeli army, they would not be included? In not in the date. Not? They, they should not be included. I'd be surprised if they are included. They are not in the date. The, the Ramatkal should not be here. Once he becomes a politician, he should be in the data. That, that creates a different kind of bias, because uh, then it excludes from the Druze population. I mean, if that's the case... It excludes only the small group who stays it's in not small. for kebab. It's or, not small, though. But still, I have people who are in the data. Yeah, but no, but it, it's, it, there is a selection going on. I mean, people, if, if people who stay on in the military service, and many of them do, <clears throat> then there is a selection. So you only have people who did not choose or were not chosen to, to, to continue to continue to stay. Either way, it's a problem, but... I, I, yeah, either way, it's a problem which you cannot avoid. <coughs> yeah. We always can claim it's a lower bound, by effect, because if they stay and they have their wages, the Ramadkal, his wage is much higher than mine, for sure, it's huge. Right? So it might, might be. Again, Ramadkal is just the head of all these. But then your, uh, your randomized experiment is sort of a uh, little problem, because, uh, you know, your dummy is not like really I'm forced to serve, I'm not forced to serve, but is uh, I'm forced to serve I'm not staying after the end of military service. And you're taking away those who are successful enough as soldiers, they stay up. So that's actually a problem. Because it's, it's, you don't have random allocation anymore. I, I think uh, if I it's, it's a random allocation, especially if you look at the young guys, you know, I mean, the older, because he's to become a general, and as Eric says, you have to be 50 or something, right? So anyway, this group is not in my in my data. I'm looking for young people, who well, right? Even, even if they're young, I mean, there lots and lots of them doing, you know, I, I can, exactly, we know the jobs that they do. I mean, many <laughs> I of them ask are you about how many people arrive to this. Many of them are basically, a huge number of them are, are uh, riot police who are, uh, breaking down uh, resistance in, 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 uh, in the territories. 
and they are, they are uh, you know, these the young guys. Is not, that, not only, not only. These are the young guys. Not, the, the, not only. They are professional Yaman. We are one guy in Gaza. We know his story, but that's one in Israel. So, no, it's not just not. I know story. about who you are talking. Yeah. But uh, again, again, if you have data, and I think you have, because your son was working in that. Ah. Send, send me that data. <laughs> No, no, not much about it, but distribution. I want to know who stays. Uh, okay. <laughs> See, it's in our security, so I can clear out the security, I cannot touch these things. Anyway, so now I think, okay, why this premium is, by, by, what, by what it's driven, the mechanism behind it. How many people found an effect, but what, why? It's, do I get higher probability of getting higher schooling? So I, I check human capital volumes. Maybe there are the reason. So I serve in the army, then I have higher probability of what? Two things I check. Living in top 10, percent paying in locality. So I, I, you know, again, I have Israel, I have cities and villages, and I sort them. So that's what I call internal migration. Do people who after military have more probability to migrate to high paying cities? For example, here, for example, Tbilisi, the average of Tbilisi is much higher than that in Kodaisi, right? So people migrate here to get higher wage. This happens, this internal migration happens all the time. Is it happening more for people who serve? I find zero effects here, which means it's not more probable for me if I'm Jews, to migrate, not more than an Arab who would migrate anyway, to a higher thing, like to Tel Aviv, right? From, from my village to Tel Aviv. Anyway, another, so this is, this is profit regression. These are the marginal effects, but it's profit because my daily variable is one for high paying cities, zero otherwise. And this, the second column, is for having higher education, which means 13 or more, some college or more, 13 plus. Also, it's not different from zero, which means there's no difference between Arabs and non-Arabs. And Druze in this case, right? Non-Druze Arabs and the Druze Arabs, there's no difference between them due to, due to the army. So the army does not help you be more educated or living in a better place, which means some other reason, but I have no data to check that reason, but I claim it is social capital, not human, not human capital. By the way, this is the other group. Also zeros, all these first line zeros, that's what I care about, statistically zero. Right. And also economically, that goes in the wrong direction. If my wage is higher because I'm Druze, I should get higher probability, not minus. So the wrong direction, and it's statistically zero anyway. So that, this graph, again, I check the distribution among industries, between the uh, the, among the Druze and among the non-Druze Arabs. Right? So they, how they change. So I compare the distribution in our industries after age, service age and before. So what, what do we find here? For example, if this is negative, this is below zero, right? Means some people, some non Jews Arabs left agriculture. They have to go somewhere. This graph should add up to zero, right? Because all those who go down should go up somewhere. So Arabs, see non Jews Arab, non -Druze Arabs before and after. With this age compared to 19 and below, they a little bit leave agriculture, a little bit leave manufacturing, a little leave construction, and they go to work in the transport and communication, which is also another low paying job. Not a big deal. But for Jews, there's much much happening here. They leave all the agriculture. Those are well-known farmers. So they leave the farms in the Galil and so on, and they join public administration. This is after the age, the military age. Public administration, legal estate, and manufacturing. All these, you need connections to be there. For me to go and albeit some company, in, in, like in Haifa, it's, it's, it's high-tech company, I have to have connections, or I have to have served somewhere. So I claim it's due to connection. In the army, my today's commander, becomes my tomorrow's employer. And Israel is a small state, and this really happens. The, the one who was your general becomes your employer afterwards. And all employers in Israel are most employers, are, are Jewish, in the Jewish sector. So my, my employer would be, uh, you know, I have known him in the army. That's why I got, I got the job in the first place. But I don't study that question about employment. I, I will come to it. So this gave me the intuition that, oh, social capital, networking is that issue. It's not that I become more educated or do internal migration, no. I know the people who will can employ me in the future. So that's a major benefit. It's networking, but networking is one element of what we call social capital. There's human capital, there's physical capital, human capital, and there's social capital. But why is this working for the Jews and not for the non-Jews? Non-Jews are not serving anyway. Yes. Okay. Non-Jews are not there. So I don't benefit from that interaction. That's why I, that's why I think. Jews are not here. Ali, how to understand this, uh, this uh, chart I just, um, what, what are the bars? Yes, oh, sorry. So the bar, again, that's zero, right? So it's negative. Negative means there's a change. How many, let's say 90% in agriculture before, they became 70% in agriculture of the population. So I lost 20%, they relocated to somewhere else, to other industry. It's like over time? I compare two groups, people. 
19 and below, and people 25 and uh, 34. So I have two groups of people, Druze. I see the distribution of industries before and distribution after. And then I make the difference in the distribution. So this graph says that the Druze after army age, they are less. They are what here, like 10% or 15% and say less in agriculture. So these less have to go somewhere and they fill up other industries. Here we have all the industries in Israel. Agriculture, manufacturing, electricity, and all the industries. Yes. So in, in principle, I find your explanation very plausible. But uh, the question is whether you really have to reduce it to these connections. I mean, you know, being in the army helps me to integrate better into this society, not remaining this isolated group anymore. And people may learn many things there. I mean, some farmers from some Druze villages, they learn how a modern organization works, right? So it could be more generally, you could say I, I that these people are more point. they will be more integrated right, right, into right. a modern economy than they were before. This sociological literature, you know, it says about this thing. Once I, I'm not minority anymore. Once I, you know, work with these people and served in the army, I not don't yes. become. So that's the, the other I, thing is if you want to if, if you want to support your uh, your um, like discrimination story as I, I I think you want to do you could say that um, but, but I think that there is something true about it you know uh, I, by going to the army I'm proving my loyalty to the country you see I mean the employers might say Jewish employers might say well the guy is an Arab I don't like him right, right, but, right. but he went to the army so we have said the same in Hebrew right. Is, uh, that he's a, I mean, out of here. he's a good guy, right? He's a good Arab. He went to the army. But he has to. Country. He has to. I don't know if he's good because he has to. If he just left home and came to me voluntarily, I say, okay, he's a good guy. Uh -huh, I see. That's but right. he, because he has to, I'm not sure this is like I systematically that's true. That's true. That's true. That's the point. Yeah, there are some Arabs who volunteer, Muslim Arabs. There are very few people. I don't care about that here. Again, the Druze claim, that's in Hebrew. Last time we saw Georgia showing us in Japanese. <laughs> For you, this is like Japanese. And this is like Yehudi, which means. The Druze claim, we are Jews in duties. When it comes to duties, we are Jews to the state. Once we need our rights, we are treated like Arabs. I saw this inside. I was a student at the Hebrew University. I was passing some street. They had demonstration. Druze people had these signs. Says, we are, you know, Jews. When you need us, but when we need you, we are Arabs. So I like that. And I saw this when I was a student, and this became part of my paper today. Things stay here. And that's what they claim. Now what we saw, they are wrong and right. They are right <coughs> because their wage is still really Jew lower than the Jewish wage, even though they serve. But they are wrong because they are treated better than us. So at least they get something out of this. Right? So they are wrong and they are right. The other day, another thing, what I wanted to say about employment. And the other day I was in a playground in a Jewish city close to my town, like in Hadera. So I took my daughters to some playground, right? And they are inside and I'm outside looking. And I saw this sign that says, you know, take off your shoes, don't put food on, you know, the stuff. Playground. Fatima and Mariam are playing inside and I'm reading this. So this small announcement. So I took a picture on my phone, and then I zoom to that announcement, and zoom, and zoom, and zoom. It says, what they want? It means part-time jobs, but only for veterans. So they offer part-time jobs. For that place where the playground, you know, I don't know why you need to be a veteran to help kids play, right? I remember Eric told me after he finished the army, he went to a job interview and they asked him, what do you know? He said, I know how to kill people. Because he asked, what, what your skills? He said, I know how to kill. That's what they taught us. <laughs> and if you need that to play with the kids, I'm afraid. So that's a way to discriminate. Instead of saying, we need, again, he said again, we need workers, but only after the army. Why do you need the West Army? Why my skills in the army relate to the kids in the playground? I want to understand. To protect the children. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to, no, but that's for cleaning and for cashier, not for protection. There's no guard there. What if it has some kind of social policy or something to, to integrate the veterans into the society? But again, that's nice claim of a uh, disguise of discrimination. They don't want to say, we need Jewish people only. They say, we need after army. <laughs> you, <laughs> that's how they do it in Israel. I, I just saw this, I was happy to capture it with my phone. Well, but exactly, so the Druze might benefit from that, and I say here, I claim later on, I don't study employment in this study, but then I can be, say, I'm getting a lower, I'm getting a lower bound. They, they benefit not only in wages, they also have more jobs than me. So my benefit is less than it should be even, because if I take care of employment, they, they have double benefits. Once they work, they get higher wage, but higher wage, but they do get job. I don't get jobs. Arabs are less likely to get, to get these jobs. Yes. One more comment, but this one is uh, maybe positive. Uh, I mean, a way to spin the paper, to give it some spin. 
And that is the fact that you, you are dealing with a society that is multilingual as well. Right. Ma multilingual. And I refer to the Hebrew issue. In and, the paper. and the army is actually an excellent mechanism to make everybody speak the same language. Right. And that then becomes... They a, know Hebrew before and after, but the, the accent but becomes the, better. Of course, it's an accent. It's, right. it's uh, the, the, right. the way you wave your hands. I say that in the paper, but I cannot check it for sure. I haven't had data. Yeah. But this is something, you know, uh, here in Georgia, for instance, I, I know in the labor data, when you look at the labor data, I, I believe the Armenians uh, are... Uh, uh, there is a wage premium for to not being an Armenian, or be, not being an Azeri. I think the Georgians wages. Yes, one of my students are, 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 are higher. Study, like six years ago. And one of, one of the reasons is, is well, actually, if you show the slide with, that you had with the table, show the slide with the table. The wage gaps, which one? Yeah, yeah the, the the one the one go go. It will take forever. Okay. No. Uh, 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 the, the graph, the no, 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 no. The, the, with the bars that I asked with this one. Mm -hmm. So you see the uh, in 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 Georgia. We have, we have this gap issue, um, and the, the interesting thing is that you look at public administration here, which the Druze are so uh, benefit exactly. because they, they can get jobs in public administration. Language is key there to get jobs in public administration. Now, if you look at the uh, Armenian... And connections. Well, connections as well, but language is definitely key. And if you look at the uh, public administration jobs, as the city like BDC, how many Armenians have public administration jobs which is the best paid, I, I best paid job. In, jo in Georgia, the best paid jobs are in public administration. Also in Israel, most of them are there. It's ridiculous, but that, that's the situation. So if you have access to public right, administration right, right. jobs, you, you'll, you, in the data you will see a wage premium. And other people will tell you this is discrimination, right? You are not allowing Armenians to go there, maybe. Well, I don't think that there's anybody uh, not allowing, but you, you have to know the language. Ah, so Armenians who are here don't speak Georgian? They do speak well, they do. Georgian. Some do. Some do. If you are from Tbilisi, you do, but if you are, if you are Armenian from... They don't yeah, your education no, is there much is. lower if you are not uh, from Tbilisi. No, no. assuming you have the same, same education, I'm surprised. Yeah, yeah. 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 If you are Armenian from Akhalkala, you are Akhalsi. Then, then... Right. Akhalsi, they speak to from Akhalkala. They would know. Or very... Now, I, now I know something. I had advantage in Akhalkala. I was the other day. I spoke Georgian better than the local people. <laughs> now I know why I know Georgian more than others. Okay. So so they have no about Georgia. Georgia. Okay. I don't know Armenian more than Zimbabwe. They say speak your language. It starts with kindergartens, actually, because there is a huge, um, sorry to kind of delve into this issue, but in Georgia, there's a huge difference in attendance of um, public kindergartens. So if you look at minorities, uh, Azeri, exactly. Armenian, very little participation of, uh, of kindergarten children in... in, 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 in uh, they stay home. They stay at home. Uh, and uh, the other kids do to go to kindergartens. I mean, of course, not in small villages, but in, in small towns. So uh, right there, you already have a, a language uh, barrier. barrier you know, right there. That's what I, I think it also depends. Uh, it depends on the region, right? For of example, course, of course. In, uh, some, Kalaki, some you more, get more Armenians going some than more, some Georgia. less. But but on average, yeah, yeah on average, you, you will have that effect. Good. So let's conclude again. What I found here is huge effects. The effects go up with time. Not only they're huge, not only statistically significant and economically significant, but they increase with time. And I say, if I take care of employment, being more employable after army, I even underestimate that. It. It's even bigger than that. So it's more than all what we found in the literature. Heterogeneity, the literature always says, if you benefit, it's, it's due to if you are unskilled. In my study, I don't see a big issue, right? So there's no heterogeneity. Everybody benefits the same, all of the same. The evidence, if you combine my findings with the literature, you can summarize in one line. In small countries, military benefits you, do it. In big countries, it will not benefit you unless you are an unskilled minority guy, like black American, right? With low education, then you might benefit. If you are white American, you might be harmed, or at least not benefit. So th this is kind of summarizing the literature. Again, according to the small country, there's some positive effect. Other big countries, Germany, UK, zero effect. So, and my effect is huge, but it's a small country. Now it's a special country, as you know, Again, for the political issue, for the Arabs and Jews, for the small being very small, so social capital plays a big role. And today, again, military in the Israeli society is a, it's a social thing. It's a social thing. I mean, many, many people, uh, again, know, know their uh, husbands and wives in the army. They know their employers in the army. It's a very small state. You know, you leave the army, you know everybody. So because of that, the, the effect is huge. So even if the same mechanism works in the US, the effect will be lower because you don't know the guy. 320 million people, you are not going to meet any guy from the army. But in Israel, you do meet him every day. 
So it's a small state. That's why social capital plays a role. Again, it's a claim, it's a statement. I don't test that because I have no way to, to test it. Language is an issue which I raise in the paper, but I don't test, I don't have uh, an evidence on that. So again, most probable explanation to me was social capital networking, which can be summarized in this graph, right? That's networking, these two guys, and you know that you wage with time. That's time, that's wage. If you know how to kill, you know how to kill, there's not an, an explanation. Thank you very much, guys, for attending.